Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as we appreciate the passion and craftsmanship of Europe's artisans along with Rick tonight. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our friend and tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Thank you, Gabe, and thank you all for tuning in, as a lot of you do every week, to Monday Night Travel. And as Gabe mentioned, tonight we're going to be celebrating the artisans all across Europe. It's so much fun to have a special angle on our travels, and that's it for tonight. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you just feel right at home. I mean, uh, I just, I had this shoo out a couple of thousand people just a few minutes ago as this is our second show. We're all ready. Uh, make yourself at home. You can toss your coats in the room next door. I don't need a coat today. The ping pong table's downstairs. Toilet's just around the corner. You're welcome to step out on the deck. Most importantly, settle in, I hope, with your favorite travel partner, something to drink, something to eat, and we're going to celebrate travel like we do every Monday night. You know, I spend 100 years, 100 days every year in Europe on normal times, and of course, these last couple of years have been kind of tough that way. When I'm not in Europe, I'm traveling around the United States, enthusing about European travel. And that's what I get to do on Monday night. And I'm glad there's somebody I can enthuse to, and that is you. So thank you for joining. Uh, this is our second show. So I'm well into this bottle of wine and I want to introduce it to you. This is Medoc. Do you see that word M-E-D-O-C? All that stuff is French, isn't it? Down at the bottom, uh, Bordeaux. That's a very important region in France, uh, southwest France, uh, near Basque country, near the mountains, the, the Pyrenees. And MEDOC is a peninsula north of the city of Bordeaux. And I'm not much on traveling to Bordeaux, but I'm sure much on drinking it. And that's a word I look for anywhere in France, Medoc, M-E-D-O-C. It's a dominant, uh, it's a blend, uh, mostly dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon. It's powerful, it's tannic, it's complex, it's kind of oaky. Mm. And it's a good word to know, medoc. Okay, so that's our drink for the evening. And this is my sustenance. And uh, I just love a good cheese and uh, charcuterie board and a nice baguette chopped up for your pleasure. And um, in here, I'll just give you a quick tour. I've got my pate. And a pate is something you'll find all over in France. And this particular one is duck liver and pork with cognac. It's a spreadable paste with herbs and spices and wine. And I love smearing that on my baguette. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of fun to do. And then here we have a, an alpine cheese. It's called a comte. It's from a region of France called the Franche Comte. And this is the province right next to the Swiss Alps. So this is an Alpine kind of cheese. It's cow's milk. This particular one is one year old. And in the Alps, you can have cheese, you know, from one to three years old. It gets sharper and harder with age. This is a beautiful cheese. Here we have a blue cheese. And, you know, you, know, you got your gargonzola in Italy. You got your Stilton in uh, England. And in France, you got your Roquefort. And this is a sheep cheese. And it, the veins of blue in there are just the mold. And that gives it a nice, sharp, and salty taste. I love a blue cheese when I'm having a variety of cheeses. And you know me, or if you know me, you know I like my stinky cheeses, my expensive, creamy, drippy, oozy, stinky, fragrant cheeses. It just smears on your bread so delightfully. And this is a classic brie. And uh, brie is a buttery, creamy cheese. It's made from cow's milk. This particular one is from the Vosges Mountains, the, the mountain range that separates France from the Alsace over by the German side of, of France. And they make it with raw milk normally. But in order to export this to the United States, they had to pasteurize it. It's still good, but it'd be even better in France. And then, of course, you got your baguette. So that's my, my cheese and meat board with my wine. Now, I'm going to take you to our website, ricksteves.com, and we're going to talk about where we're going to go. And when you go to ricksteves.com, that's where we store all of our information and good information for free as our publicity stunt at Rick Steves Europe. And you land at ricksteves.com and you've got everything. Now, we've got this Classroom Europe uh, link. And if you go to Classroom Europe, you got 500 little three to five minute clips, no ads, fast, it's free, it's designed for teachers and homeschooling parents, but travelers use it a lot too. And you can click, click, click on whatever uh, you want to search for, and you can search for it in any number of ways. And then you put it into your own um, 
archive. I've got my own collection of playlists. You could too. It's absolutely free and teachers are doing this and it's just a fun thing. We've put together Artists in Europe there and that is about 30 minutes of artists and fun that we have cobbled together from our um, uh, Classroom Europe program. I do want to remind you when you go to ricksteves.com, the big news this last couple of weeks is our tour program. Let me just take a moment to remind you that we have opened up our tours now for business. And we've had, we had um, 24,000 people signed up on our tours last year. We had to give them all back their deposits because we had to shut it down for COVID. We reopened our tours. And right now we've got 23,000 people have signed up in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, if you, it's about 80% sold out now, but that still means there's 5,000 seats available. And if you click on browse our tours, you can find a section that shows you all of what we've got available. And it's a little frustrating with a thousand tours available and 700 of them sold out. But what we have here is a button that says seats available. And if you click on seats available, you don't get all tours, you get seats available tours. And it, these are starting with the, the tours with the most seats available. And, uh, and then you can click on one of these and then you can see just what's available on that tour. For instance, the best of Sicily, you could click on dates and prices. And as of today, you can see on our Sicily tours, we've got join the waitlist, join the waitlist, join the waitlist, join the waitlist, join the waitlist on, on all of the later tours, October, basically sold out from February through October. And what we've got is uh, tours earlier that are possible. No, no, I guess it's designed all through the years. So these are just departures throughout the year that are still with seats available. It's a little bit overwhelming with a thousand different departures, but you can go to ricksteves.com and click that and see exactly what tours are available. I'm making a big deal about that because we have not even made these tours public yet. We have not announced them to the general public. We're doing that in a couple of weeks. This is just um, people who, that attend gigs like this that I'm giving. And also it is people who signed up last year who we had to cancel and now we can take them to Europe again. And it's people who are on our wish lists. So if you're curious about a tour, Right now, it looks like we're not doing any tours in 2021, but we're going to be doing tours full steam ahead in 2022. God willing, Europe gets its vaccines. We get our vaccines. The trajectory looks great. We got great touring coming up in 2022, and we hope you're on board. I'm going to be on one of the first tours, I'll tell you that. Okay, now we're going to go to Artists in Europe, and I'm just so excited about Artists in Europe. Before I've never done this on Monday Night Travel before, but this is my book, my newest book, uh, For the Love of Europe. And in here, we have 100 essays. And one of the summation essays in the very end of the book is an article about artists in Europe. And let me, it's just a couple of minutes, but I'm going to read this to you because there's a, a, a challenge all over the world to keep artisans vibrant and alive. And let me give you an update on what's going on in Europe that way. When you've traveled in Europe, as long as I have, you experience changes big and small. And more and more, I notice traditional local businesses making way for cookie cutter chains and synthetic conformity. In historic city centers, as rents go up, longtime residents, families, and craftspeople are pushed out. Small hotels, one of a kind shops, and individual craftspeople simply don't have the scale, the economic clout to compete with the big guys. In Florence, for example, the end of rent control made costs spike immediately, driving artisans and shops catering to locals out of business to be replaced by upscale boutiques and trendy eateries. The same thing happened in Barcelona's Gothic Quarter, as landlords evicted long-term renters to make more money off short-term Airbnb rentals, mom and pop shops lost their traditional clientele and they went out of business. In Istanbul, the city wants mo to move the iconic gold and silver workshops away from the Grand Bazaar to a place outside the city center, while made in Taiwan gift shops are able to pay higher rents and take their place, changing the character of the market. Craftsmen lament that the next generation, drawn to the energy of big cities and lured by opportunities with big corporations, will not be there to carry on the traditions. The artists whose craft handmade guitars in Madrid, the family winemakers of Burgundy, the fishermen who sell shrimp on the Oslo harborfront, these have all been fixtures in my lifetime of travel in Europe. What will become of these rich facets of local culture if the younger generation opts out? Of course, I can't blame the children of artisans for jumping into the modern rat race. I'm not an old school piano technician like my father. 
but it's worth considering how the future will look when economic scale and efficiency trump artisan values. It's a real joy when I stumble onto true artisans who are committed to doing things the traditional way, by hand, in communities that understand the importance of keeping them in business. I urge travelers to seek out and support artisan experiences while traveling before it's too late. And then there's a whole article following up that of my favorite artisans in Europe. Well, we're going to be looking at some artisans tonight. I, I just looked up the definition of artisan. An artisan is from the French word artisan and the Italian word artigiano. It is a skilled craft worker who makes or creates material objects partly or entirely by hand. Artisans practice a craft and may, through experience and aptitude, reach the expressive levels of an artist. Now, more than just artisans in this next half hour or so, we're going to see lots of handiwork, of course, coppersmiths and so on, but also industrious European, like Dutch who reclaim their land, and slice of life aspects of European culture, like um, aristocrats who run big manor houses that are the, the pinnacle of a society that keeps those artisans employed. We're going to start now in Italy, in Multipulciano, and we're going to visit a mom and pop shop Mom sells and dad cranks out the goods. And this is the coppersmith Cesare. And if you're lucky, and if you've been to Multipulciano, you have a beautiful copper saute pan. Look at that. Made by a man who you know, Cesare. And he's an icon in his town. And now I've got Cesare's art in my home because I patronized an artisan. Let's go now to the part of Italy so rich in wine and culture and sightseeing and artisans. Here we go. The characteristic lanes of stony Multipulciano are lively with family-run artisan shops. The Mazzetti copper shop is full, both decorative and practical items. Signora Mazzetti, the coppersmith's wife, shows off her husband's work. The production of hand-hammered copper vessels like these is a dying art. And around the corner, the coppersmith himself is hard at work at his grandfather's forge. Cesare Mazzetti is an institution in this town. He's carrying on his father's and his grandfather's trade by hammering into existence a variety of copper objects in his cavernous workshop. Cesare's world is like a working museum classic anvil, wooden mallets, stencils dating from 1857 that have been passed down through the generations. Artfully finishing a copper pan with a coat of tin, Cesare's craftsmanship evokes the hard-working, highly skilled craft guilds that once dominated small-town Italy's commercial and civic life. Yeah, you gotta love Chasery. And you know, you saw the tourists peeking in his door. That's what happens. You, you poke around and you find these artisans doing their work and you, you peek in and he can ignore you or he can invite you in, whatever. Within one block of Chasery's shop in that town of Multipulciano, you got the main square, you got my favorite B&B, you've got my favorite family winery, the Cantucci winery, and you've got my favorite steakhouse for that Chianina beef. It's all right there in Multipulciano. I just love it. Now, we're going to take a little break because we've been at this artisan stuff for about two minutes. And we're going to play Where's Rick? And uh, this uh, we've done this a little bit in the past, and we're going to do it again. Every one of our TV shows, there's been 150 of them. It starts with what we call a tease. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best gear. This time we're doing that and that and that. And it's sort of a teasing you. And then we are in, boom, and then we reveal where we are. Now we've taken five teases here and it's a game. It's a drinking game. And we're going to pause for five seconds before I reveal where we are. And then you've got to all shout out where we are, where you think we are. If you get it wrong, you got to take it right. If you get it right, I'm going to take a drink. Okay. That's how we're going to play this game. Now let's play Where's Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Steves back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're really on the edge. Stay with us as we explore the best. Of Northern Ireland. Did you get it? All right. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time. 
Oh my goodness, we're on top of a lacy Gothic cathedral where the tourists can go and wander around. It's a forest of spires. Where are we? We're in North Italy, enjoying ah. the lofty and inspiring heights of Milano. Thanks for joining us. I love it. Does Jackson like shrimp? He does. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're down on the beach, got a good cold beer, and the shrimp's on the barbie. It must be. OK, this is the little beach with a line of cabins. These are the cute little cabins in the, that are so in style in this country because they're into hoogly stuff, little quaint, simple stuff. What could it be? The best Denmark. of Denmark. Thanks for joining us. Denmark. He likes that. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. And this time we're in the very southwest tip of Southwest tip of, celebrate this. Great Britain, ah. it's Land's End, and we're exploring England's Cornwall. Thanks for joining us. Did you get it right? Land's End. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe, and this time we're filling up on some unforgettable culture. Holy cannoli, we're in. This has got to be the tastiest cheese we've ever done. I just love it to have these fresh right at the bakers. Oh, where is it? Where is it? Cannoli. Sicily, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Okay, hey. Cheers. Nastrave. Sante. Mmm. A votre sant. Hey, right now we're going to go to the Netherlands. And the Netherlands created their own land. There's lots of land in Netherlands where the people who live on it are older than the land itself. Hard work, ingenious people. They created mills that could pump the water out. And the mills themselves powered the work that kept the artisan millers in business. All of the industries possible because of that industry and because of the artisans who ran those mills, the millers. The Netherlands is small, smaller than West Virginia, and the most densely populated country in Europe. Most of the country is below sea level, reclaimed with great effort over many generations from the sea. That's why they like to say, God made the world, but the Dutch, we made Holland. This is Polderland. Much of it once covered by the sea, it was encircled by dikes and dams and then drained. To pump out all that water, the Dutch used one of their leading natural resources, the wind. For centuries, the Dutch built windmills. Over a thousand survive, and many still work. Some welcome visitors interested in a peek at the clever engine that powered the creation of this land. I'm standing on reclaimed land, 12 feet below sea level. The challenge for the Dutch, to keep this land dry by pumping water uphill. Many windmills used their wind power to turn an Archimedes screw like this, which by rotating in a tube, lifted water up and over the dike. To catch the desired amount of wind, millers, like expert sailors, know just how much to unfurl the sails or furl them back as necessary. Mills are built with sturdy oak timber frames to withstand the constant tension. These timbers have stood strong since the 1600s. When the direction of the wind shifts, the miller turns the cap of the building, which weighs many tons, to face the breeze. As he spins the winch, it all slides on these wooden roller bearings. Then with a hefty chain, he anchors it in the correct spot. As the wooden cogs connect, wind becomes clean power. Archimedes' screw rotates, and the water spirals up. Wow, think of Holland when it was just littered with these windmills, centuries old. Such ingenious way to harness clean power. And it was the power back then, centuries ago. And these mills would pump the land dry, and then the millers would harness that power in order to run sawmills, in order to grind the grain, in order to do any number of things that kept the artisans powered to do their thing. 
The Dutch had long eyed what was the vast inland Zuider Sea as the source of new land. Hmm. This 18 mile long dam was built as one of many steps in turning that sea into farmland. The master plan, cordon off sections of the shallow sea with hundreds of miles of dams and dikes like this. Then, by draining each section dry, piece by piece, build a bigger country. These fields were once the bottom of that wide open sea. Gradually, land was reclaimed, and today the Netherlands is twice the size it was 400 years ago. Because of this reclamation, what had been fishing villages on little islands, like Schokland, are now high and dry mounds rising above fertile farmland. Behind this sturdy stone and wood seawall, this tiny community once harvested the sea. In its day, this cannon warned visitors of a high tide. I'm standing below sea level. I know that because I picked up a handful of dirt and it came with some shells. And this marks sea level, according to the official Amsterdam measure, zero. Imagine, a couple generations ago, this buoy bobbed in the harbor. What was the bottom of the sea is now productive farmland. And when they drained that sea, they found all sorts of interesting things on the seabed. They found even warplanes from World War II that were shot down. Of course, then they had to take that seabed and turn it into arable soil. And they did that, and certain crops work well on it, and certain crops don't. Flowers are perfect in the reclaimed farmland of the polderland of the Netherlands. The salty seabed soil, with a mix of rain, sunshine, and clever crop rotation, eventually becomes extremely fertile. One thing the polder soil grows particularly well is flowers. And here at the Alsmere Flower Auction, it's clear. Flowers are big business in Holland. Visitors are welcome in this, one of the world's largest commercial buildings. They witness millions of dollars in the trafficking of flowers. In its auction halls, hundreds of wholesalers bid on trainloads of flowers as they roll by. To get the flowers out as fresh as possible, everything happens fast, including the bidding. A Dutch auction is speedy because the prices go from high to low. Batches of flowers are sold to the first buyer to press the button. Buyers must be lightning quick. It's the only way to sell so many flowers in one morning. Strolling the fragrant catwalk, it's fun to peer down on the action. They boast that fresh flowers go from cutting in the fields to flower shops anywhere in Europe within 24 hours. I want to remind you, if you want to see the action like we are, you got to go early in the morning. That's when it's happening, and you can do that. This is right next to the Schiphol Airport, the Amsterdam Airport. It's wide open to the public in normal times, and uh, that's the Alsmere Flower Auction. Um, we, by the way, we, we begged and pleaded, and finally they let our cameraman get on one of these carts and get the point of view, the POV stops as going through all of this action. It was so much fun to see this. Workers scramble to get each buyer's purchase assembled on a train and shipped out. The Dutch are the world's leading flower exporters. 80% of these flowers are going abroad. Every day from this building, 20 million flowers are shipped, destined to make someone's day. So you wonder, you might wonder, how would you know about this? Well, that's what guidebooks are for. Not just my guidebook, any guidebook will list the Alsmere Flower Auction and how to get there and when it's open and, and, and how to enjoy it the most. That's what you gotta do. Equip yourself with good information, expect yourself to work, and you will travel smartly. Now we're gonna go to England. We're gonna go to the Cotswold Villages where they don't have any good wine like this. Ha, they got great beer. But remember, you can get your friend wine in England. Mm. What's the word? M-E-D-O-C, Medoc. Good, affordable, quality Bordeaux. Bordeaux, oh, I love it. Now we're gonna visit the home of an impoverished aristocratic landlord, a nobleman who is land rich and cash poor, like so many noblemen in Europe these days. They've gotta actually open up their big mansion and let tourists pay to see it. It's like getting a chance to go see Downton Abbey or something like that. This guy is really, I love him. I've known him for 20 years. He used to be Lord Needpath, but then when you're a nobleman and somebody dies and you inherit a different uh, title, 
you're no longer Lord Needpath. Now you're the Earl of Weems and people call him Weems. Um, but he's a fascinating guy. I'm kind of jealous because he hangs out with Rod Stewart, but he welcomes tourists into his home and he let us come in and he took us on a little tour. So we're going to do that here in the Cotswold Village. Throughout this region, a few of the vast domains of England's most powerful families have survived. The Cotswolds are dotted with elegant Downton Abbey-type mansions. Today, with the high cost of maintenance and heavy taxes, some noble families have opened their homes to the public to help pay the bills. Stanway House, home of the Earl of Weems, is one such venerable manor house. The Earl, whose family goes back centuries, welcomes visitors two days a week. Walking through his house offers a surprisingly intimate glimpse into the lifestyles of England's nobility. And the gracious and likably eccentric Earl has agreed to personally show us around his ancestral home, including a peek at some touching family mementos. Hair cut off. Notice now how for the Earl, history, he's just nonchalant about history. He's part of it. He just, he's sort of oblivious to the fact that most of us don't have locks of hair in our drawers that are 250 years old. Most of us can't refer to Charles I as if we knew him, even though he died centuries ago. This man is part of English, England's heritage, and to be able to meet him is quite an honor. So we're going to visit his um, locker with the old hair. Members of the family. That uh, was a tradition. Uh, it was in, certainly in this house, it was a tradition. Yeah. And it's kept in this drawer here. And um, for instance, this is... Uh, it says, Papa's hair. My sister gave it me March the 11th, 1771. This piece of paper from 1771. Mm -hmm. And then that's the hair oh inside. Which is just as fresh as the day it was cut off. Whoa. And that's his hair cut off on the day his wife died of pneumonia. So this is a huge it, table. It is. It's 23 feet long. And what's the game? It's called shuffleboard or shovelboard. Mm -hmm. It was um, known in Henry VIII's time. Um, this one was built, we think, in 1625, uh, just the beginning of the reign of Charles I. And uh, you use these ten pieces, mm -hmm. um, and you try and well, let's try again. shovel them up to the far end. That's a nice one. Mm -hmm. It may be a game for English aristocrats, but this Yankee commoner is going to give it a try. Very good. Very good. One point. Very good. Very nice, but two foot short. Another interesting artifact is what was called a chamber horse, a sprung exercise chair from the 1750s. And you did that. You bounce up and down and your liver gets shaken. For a hundred years, fine ladies would sit on here and yep, get their and liver done. And <laughs> fine gentlemen too, I think. Fine gentlemen too, yep. yep. A chamber horse. Mm. I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? But it's just like yeah. going to the gym nowadays. For years, he, the, the Earl has showed me his, his plans for this fountain. And uh, I mean, literally years, for a decade I was visiting and he'd show me his plans and then he finally did it. And he'd been working on this for a long time and now it's a destination just to see his amazing uh, gravity-fed geyser. Lord Weems has rebuilt the old fountain in his backyard and today, as one of the highest gravity-fed fountains in the world rockets 300 feet into the sky, it's the talk of the Cotswolds. For commoners, the Lord's sprawling parkland backyard makes for a jolly good day out. So these are the experiences you can have when you go to Europe. It's our passion when we put a tour together. Our tours just love this place. And you can do it. You don't need to take a Rick Steves tour to have these experiences, but you've got to do the thinking that we do on our tours so you can weave it into your itinerary. If you're going to tour the Cotswolds, the best home bases are either Stone the Wold or Chipping Campton. And they're both two hours west of London, quite accessible from London. Now we're going to go to Switzerland, the Lauterbrunnen Valley. The Interlaken is the famous resort. It's a jumping off point for this region called the Berner Oberland, the Bernice Oberland. And when we're thinking about Switzerland, things are so accessible. Everything's a, less than a two hour train ride away from the Zurich airport. So you could spend your, uh, you could fly in and be to your hotel easily on the same day. You could be staying up in the mountains and get out to the airport with just in a couple hours. And when you're in the countryside, like, side, like you'll see in a moment, you're gonna be surrounded by artisan activities like the cheese maker we're about to visit high in the Swiss Alps. Nestled in the bottom of the valley is the town of Lauterbrunnen, 
Its central location makes it a handy hub from which to explore either side of the valley. From here, a funicular, which carries bikes as well as people, takes me straight up the mountain. Excuse me, how, how steep is this? 61%. 61 percent. 61 percent. Yes. And can you go back? Never. Never? Never go home. For 100 years? Yes. <laughs> this sure beats the stairs. And from the top, a scenic lane leads back to my starting point in Murin. Exploring this natural wonderland, you come upon great examples of how in Switzerland, tradition meets the modern world and survives. By the way, on this particular shoot, we had rain every day for five days. And it was just one less hike, one more indoor site. One less hike, one door indoor site. And pretty soon, almost the whole show was indoor sites. There were great slices of Swiss culture. So we visited this amazing water wheel, this water mill, water powered lumber mill. And it's because it was raining. This water wheel, 150 years old, but washed out in a recent flood, was rebuilt with its blades still powered by a mountain stream. Almost all of the timber in the mountain villages around here was cut by water-powered mills like this. Small-scale mills are slower and more labor-intensive than modern mills, but there's still a strong demand for this more expensive, but traditionally made local product. So we have to remember, Artisan crafts survive. Hand-hewn lumber from a water-powered lumber mill, it's more expensive. Swiss people like it. They build their house with it, it feels right. Now we're gonna visit a mountain farm, a small family-run dairy farm. People pay more for their small, um, you know, uh, uh, old-fashioned made cheese, and we're gonna see why. Milk cows spend their summers munching the wild herbs and flowers in the high meadows. Their milk is destined to become the treasured Alp cheese, or Alpkäse. Alpine farms doing their traditional work welcome hikers and bikers for a peek at the cheese-making action. This farm is newly renovated to meet European Union standards. Failing to meet these would mean the cheese could not be exported. But still, traditional quality survives all these modern regulations. Each morning, Veronica, a licensed and highly trained cheesemaker and her crew, milk the cows and heat a copper vat of milk over a wood fire. As it slowly curdles, it's stirred at just the right temperature until the consistency is exactly how Veronica likes it. At just the right moment, she swings the vat off the fire, then quickly dredges the vat with her cheesecloth and packs the fresh cheese into frames. This process is repeated every day for 100 days here in the high country. A cow's udder knows no weekend. In the next hut, yesterday's cheese takes a two-day bath in salt brine, and after a salty rub down, it's marked Alp cheese with a date and number and set on a shelf to age. Each village takes pride in its own cheese. This hut is full of local Alp cheese. Guten Tag. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Do you speak English? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, can I? Um, oh, I speak ein wenig Deutsch. Can I? Oh, uh, Alp Käse. Uh, yeah. Probst. Yeah, gerne. Yeah. Möchten Sie ihn testen? Ja, bitte. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is for Alp Käse. Yeah, yeah. Alp -Käse. This is Alp. Yeah. This is the Oberhaupt. So top, just up here. Yeah. Along with the younger Alpkäse, village cheesemakers produce Hubelkäse, an older, stronger cheese aged for up to three years. It's named after the Hubel, or wood plane that's used to cut it. Oh, mm. that cuts different, yeah. yeah. So this is stronger. Is, yeah, yes. Mm. It schmeckt sehr gut. Schmeckt that in it? Mm. Besser. Yeah. And you can buy it by the wheel, wedge, or a wafer-thin slice to take with you on a hike. Yep. Besten Dank. Okay, uh, danke schön. Schöne Zeit. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Bye-bye. Mm. They say the character of the Alp cheese is shaped by the herbs and the flowers the cows munch. Some locals claim they can even tell in which valley the cow is grazed just by the taste. I can't, but the taste is great. Mmm, that's very good. So, I've always walked by this little hut in Gimmelwald, my favorite town, and I didn't realize it was filled with cheese until I met this woman and she opened the door and she's got all this great cheese aging there. This is this Alpine cheese. 
Gimmelwald, by the way, is my favorite small town in Switzerland. That's where you can sleep and enjoy all these hikes nearby and you can eat cheese right on the farm. Um, and I'm eating this cheese right here from the, the part of France right over the border from Switzerland. And it's, oh, it is so good. By the way, this is part of this rainy show we did. You can actually hear the rain. I'm, I'm huddled under the eaves so I won't get raindrops on me. Maybe I'll spot it. And you can hear the rain, I, I think, as I'm talking. Oops, let me just, I'm gonna go back because I think it's kind of- Peanuts. I think it's kind of fun to hear the rain. Okay, listen for the rain. I can't, but the taste is great. Mm, that's very good. All right. Hey, now we're going to do some bloopers because if you're not screwing up, you're not having fun. We're having so much fun when we make our TV show. It just never gets old. I'm thankful for our crew and I'm thankful for the mistakes and the camera's rolling. And also when we're just messing around, the camera's rolling. Here we are. Most of these bloopers are in the Alps. Pay monkeys, get peanuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that was the opposite. <laughs> yes. Pay peanuts, get monkeys. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I bet you want the stringy cheese. You don't cheese. waste. Otherwise, the cheese is red hot. I love it. When it's hot, otherwise it's getting bad. Into cold, that's that. And you know, you shouldn't, you, sh you shouldn't make little. Just you know. Yodeling is not from your chest. It's from your throat. It's a very special skill. Check this out. It's easy. Oh. If anyone needs any tissue. Thank you. Okay. This was a fake or it's you? No, no, no. Real. We're going to eat this. Yeah. This is okay. Our next stop. Okay. So bloopers are fun. Thank you for letting me share them. I just think it's um, souvenirs of the fun we have making these shows. By the way, we couldn't do Monday Night Travel if it wasn't for our hardworking and talented team. I want to thank Gabe, Ben, Julianne, and Lisa for being on our team and help make Monday Night Travel possible. I also want to remind you that all of these clips came out of entire shows. If you want to watch the whole Alps show or the whole Bulgaria show that we're just about to see, of course, you can see the show with no breaks in its entirety for free anytime. If you just go to ricksteves.com and go into the TV section, every show we've ever made is right there for free and you can just click and watch it. In a few minutes, we're gonna be visiting with Gabe and Gabe's gonna be reading questions. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask, I'd love to answer it. Take advantage of this opportunity, fill in your question in the, in the Q&A widget. And also remember every week in the chat widget, we put links to important places we talk about in the show. And we also give you information about the food I'm eating and the wine I'm drinking and all that. So take full advantage of that. Now we are in Bulgaria. This is a personal favorite of mine, this little country, so unknown to so many Americans. And of course, Sofia is the capital. Plovdiv is the most important historic city for sightseeing that tourists all go to see. But this town here, Vilica Ternovo, is famous for its artisan crafts. And we're going to go see an entire lane filled with artisans doing their thing. Bulgaria's medieval capital, Veliko Tarnovo, one of Europe's most dramatically set cities. It winds through a misty gorge at a sharp bend of the Yantra River. The town is shaped like a natural amphitheater. It's more vertical than horizontal, with a mix of blocky modern construction and traditional Bulgarian homes. The ruins of its fortress are a reminder of the city's importance 800 years ago. They mark the site of the heavily fortified headquarters of a long-gone Bulgarian kingdom. This towering monument commemorates that vast and mighty realm. It was ruled by the Asin dynasty. According to legend, the Asin brothers planted a sword on this spot and declared, here shall be Bulgaria. This was a golden age for Bulgaria, the 13th and 14th centuries, when its empire dominated the Balkan Peninsula and stretched all the way to Ukraine. Today's locals have different aspirations. A walk along Velika Tarnovo's craft street reveals a thriving folk culture with opportunities to watch artisans at work. Rumi carves with a keen eye. Roshko paints icons with a delicate touch. Nina skillfully turns clay into art. 
Meanwhile, her son finishes each piece with patterns that go back centuries. Todor, the silversmith, with his strong hands and distinctive technique, transforms strips and strands of metal into exquisite jewelry. Wow. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. You know, it just occurred to me, I've got a piece of Bulgarian art artisan wear hanging on my wall. Hang on a second. got four of these. I bought them from an artisan who was a dissident back in communist times. And uh, let me just show you this because I just remembered it. I haven't even, I, I didn't even remember that, but this is a beautiful piece of art that I got when I was a kid in Bulgaria. And this was done during communist times. And you can see the, the workmanship there. And I've got four by this artist and they are lifelong treasures. Um, so you can, in your travels, every time I want to remember my visit to Cesare, I've got my beautiful saute pan, and I've even got my charcuterie board. This board is my favorite board. I've got lots of different boards, to, but this one is handmade. It doesn't even need to be handmade far away. This is handmade by an artisan in Spokane. Ed Bryan made this, and it's, it's, it's a work of art. It's a labor of love, and that's what I put my cheese on. And uh, we've been having a good meal today on Ed's charcuterie board. I want to remind you, we've been eating a classic brie from the Vosges Mountains near Germany. We've been having a little bit of uh, blue cheese, French style called Roquefort. We've been up in the mountains of France for this Comte, C-O-M-T-E, and we're having our pâté. And this is just a very simple meal. And you can have that anywhere in France or right here at home. And we've been drinking this delightful Bordeaux wine and it's a good bet. Your keyword is Medoc. Remember, French wine generally named by the place. Medoc is a peninsula north of Bordeaux. And that's my particular favorite in that area. Let's go back and <laughs> cap our time in Bulgaria with a little bit of folk dancing to celebrate all that artisan passion. And nearby, a folkloric dance troupe shares their traditional music. Leaving Velika Tarnovo, we cross over the Balkan Mountains. At the top of Shipka Pass, a memorial marks the site where, in 1877, a combined Bulgarian and Russian army finally turned the tide in the battle against the Ottomans. This pivotal battle led to the eventual demise of the Ottoman Empire and to the creation of the modern independent country of Bulgaria. Down in the valley, golden domes mark Shipka Church, which honors the sacrifice of those Russian and Bulgarian troops. Built by Russia a century ago, it's a fine example of the exuberant Moscovite style. Kept so it's very interesting, when you go to Bulgaria, the people always talk about how the Russians freed them from the Turkish yoke, you know, what, what an oxen pulls, the Turkish yoke, and they were just workhorses for the Ottoman Empire, those Bulgarians. Russia came down, and their little Slavic brothers, they freed them because Russia and Bulgaria are both Slavic. And then 
Bulgaria suffered about a hundred years under this Russian or Soviet yoke. Bulgarians were some, for some reason, so subservient to the Russians and the Soviets that during the Soviet time, I think there's 15 republics in the Soviet Union, and Bulgaria was jokingly referred to as the 16th Republic of the Soviet Union. And from Soviet times, they built this wacky, bizarre conference hall on the top of this remote mountain and to visit it today was one of the fascinating experiences in our travels. A nearby ridge, miles from anything, is one of the most bizarre sights I've seen anywhere. Buzluja, an abandoned monument to the Bulgarian Communist Party. This gigantic conference hall was built in the 1980s in the waning days of communist rule. With the end of the Cold War and the arrival of capitalism, it was abandoned. Today, the lyrics of the international communist anthem are literally falling off the walls. And graffiti makes it clear who won the Cold War. Venturing inside, we discover an eerie, crumbling world of vandalized propaganda, a roof that's barely held up by its hammer and sickle. And there's a faded Lenin, Marx, and Engels. You see that all over the former Soviet Union in their propaganda. Integrating mosaics, once so proud, and now just an artifact of a failed system. The so it's with such a fascinating modern history, it's easy to overlook how there was plenty happening here in ancient times. 2,400 years ago, the Thracians were burying their people in these grass-covered tombs all over Europe now. If you know where to look, you can see artifacts and remnants of civilizations from centuries before Christ, and that's true right here in Bulgaria. Thracian Plain, defined by Bulgaria's two major mountain ranges, was a busy funnel of trade throughout ancient times. Four centuries before Christ, back when Socrates and Plato were doing their thing in Athens, about 300 miles to the south, Bulgaria was known as Thrace. The Thracians were an impressive civilization. We've learned a lot about them through their tombs. Thracians buried their royalty in distinctive dome-shaped tombs that were covered in earth. Dozens of these tombs are scattered across the valley, along with hundreds of decoy mounds designed to fool grave robbers. Buried deep under those piles of earth, the tombs were impressive engineering feats from 300 years before Christ. And this replica tomb demonstrates how even in the afterlife, the deceased would be surrounded by comforting images. So what do we have? We have the Thracian king who was buried here and the royal banquet with the gods, musicians, servants, horses. And on the top of it, we have uh, races with chariots, which is a part of a funeral procession. Tombs held a trove of golden treasure, now displayed in museums throughout Bulgaria. This bronze head of a powerful king humanizes those ancient Thracians. This, well, I got to say, I'm so thankful for Stefan, our guide, and he knew all these places because that's where he takes our Rick Steves bus tours. He's our primary guide in Bulgaria. He does most of our Bulgarian tours. We don't do that many of them. But to have Stefan's expertise at our service as we made this show, such a wonderful thing. And, and he knew just where to go for, for, the, uh, for the petals, the rose petals. The region is also called the Valley of the Roses. And we're here just in time for the rose harvest. Vast fields of roses bloom overnight. Workers rise before the sun to quickly handpick the new blooms. They need to work early, before the rising sun evaporates the essential oils. While the fields smell sweet, the work is hard. At the distillery, millions of blooms are quickly unloaded. Freshness is critical. The bags of roses are stacked high before being dumped into the stills. So many flowers and so much hard work. The essential oils evaporate, then recondense, like fragrant moonshine. The payoff? A wide variety of rose oil products appreciated both abroad and at home. Kazanluk, the main town of the valley, is especially festive in May. And we happen to drop in on a national holiday. 
It's the day of Slavic culture. Throughout the country, school's out and people are celebrating. Like much of the Slavic world, Bulgaria uses the Cyrillic alphabet. And today, flowers are laid at a monument to Cyril and Methodius, the missionary saints who invented the Cyrillic script to help introduce Christianity to the Slavs back in the ninth century. It's a great excuse for a parade, a celebration not only of their alphabet, but of the Bulgarian language and culture in general. And it seems the entire town has turned out for the event. Wow, that was so much fun to be in Bulgaria. You know, think about what shapes a culture. You got its ancient history, we, we saw Thrace. Um, what grows well there? Roses, of course. Uh, who conquered it? Russia and the Ottoman Turks. It's language group, Slavic, which determines who interacts with that culture and the traditional artisan crafts. All that together shapes your experience as a visitor. And we certainly saw that in Bulgaria. Now we're gonna to go to Egypt. And I thought before we go to Egypt, I just love Egypt because it's uh, for a lot of reasons. It was one of the very last places we were filming before um, COVID hit and shut us all down. We shot there in 2019. And it was the first place I shot with my producer and my friend Simon 25 years ago. I put together a little then and now clip that shows what we shot and shot and, and told and taught 25 years ago and then how we did it today. It's just a couple of minutes. You'll notice that the old script is, the old footage is low def and square and the new footage is widescreen and high def. So if you can kind of see it go from square to nine by 16, four by three to nine by 16, you'll see 25 years of technology difference. So let's go to Egypt now, and we're gonna go then and now. Join us now as we discover the ins and outs of travels in Europe. To the ancient Egyptian, it seemed logical. You live on the east bank where the sun rises and bury your dead on the west bank where the sun dies each evening. Ironically, rather than protect the tombs, the pyramids actually attracted thieves. Again and again, again and again, pyramids were looted and pharaohs were waking up in heaven with absolutely nothing. Religion permeated Egyptian society. As long as things were going reasonably well, the gods must be happy, status quo. As long as things were going reasonably well, the gods were happy, and it was status quo. Every year the Nile would flood, bringing water and fertile silt to the land. If the gods were happy, the people had food, and you don't change things. When the gods are happy, the people have food, and you don't change things. Okay, so now we're going to go to Egypt from done by the guy on the right there, not the guy on the left. And when you go to Egypt, whether it's 25 years ago or today, you notice the power and the importance of the informal economy. People survive by what they can just scramble up in the way of business on the street. And that includes lots of artisan workshops. So Cairo is a bit scary and most of the tourists all stay together in the touristy areas. But if you can just venture away, it's easy to do with a guide or you can do it on your own if you're on, if you're on the ball. Uh, You'll, you'll find a wonderland of artisans and handicrafts everywhere you look. We're going to go to Cairo, and then we're going to do the same thing in, um, in Alexandria. And it's just a celebration of life in the streets and commerce and artisan activity. Cairo is a fascinating clash between traditional and modern, religious and secular, east and west. While its chaos can be exasperating, it can also be a rewarding challenge for the adventurous traveler. I find that simply venturing a few blocks away from the tourist-friendly bazaar, suddenly the tourists are gone, and I'm swallowed up in a completely local scene. Wandering through the colorful market streets here in Cairo's Islamic Quarter, you feel that it goes on forever. Three-wheeled tuk-tuks weave through the action. So I love these tuk-tuks, and uh, I, my dream was to film a little bit on it. So Simon agreed, and Carl agreed, and it was a little bit involved, but just in this next little sequence, think of all the elements the cameraman has to be mindful of so he can bring home the footage to cut it all together. You got to get them going by with an exterior shot. 
you got to get the point of view of the driver. You got to get me inside. You got to get me looking out and my point of view. And you got to hang on the outside of that thing and show me as we're going through the crowds. Cut it all together and you got a cool little bit. Check this out. I love to hop in one for a quick joyride. There's something strangely graceful about this chaotic dance of careening vehicles, merchants, and pedestrians. Exploring the Islamic Quarter creates a montage of memories. It's a commotion of activity. Everywhere you look, something you've never seen before is happening. So I went through here the day before and just made a checklist of places and things and visions I wanted to capture. We had that shopping list and we came back the next day and bam, 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 bam. It was like shooting ducks in a barrel. Everything was right where it was supposed to be. Everything was happening just like we hoped. Somehow, bikers balance rustic racks of bread. Craftsmen inscribe marble tombstones with verses from the Holy Quran. The peaceful soul, after a blessed life, will finally rest in heaven. With a little effort, you'll find it can be easy to become part of the scene. In this shop, a man spins delicate strands of flour that will become a favorite local pastry, kanafa. The classic street food here is koshari, lentil, rice, pasta, garlic, and tomato sauce all mixed together into a quick and cheap treat. The distinctive clanging stokes local appetites. And small bakeries are steadily producing hot balloons of pita bread, destined to be filled with falafel. Bread is subsidized by the government to make life easier for people struggling to feed their families. Walking through neighborhoods like this, you gain an appreciation for how just making ends meet is a daily struggle for millions in a teeming city like Cairo. For me. And the same thing is true in the teeming city of Alexandria. This is the great city of Alexandria on the Mediterranean shore of Egypt. And we're gonna visit a market there. It was the markets that were the highlights of our visit to urban Egypt. No visit to Alexandria is complete without venturing into its ramshackle market district. While you can buy just about anything in these thriving and exotic streets, there's also a strong sense of community that naturally comes with such population density. And to better enjoy this convivial scene, I'm joined by my Egyptian friend Tarek in a classic shisha joint. As I've done in Turkey and elsewhere in the Middle East, I occasionally enjoy this traditional and very social form of smoking. Nice, huh? This so Tarek was my, my salvation in, in, in Egypt. I've been planning this Egypt show for years with Tarek. He was so enthusiastic about hosting an American crew because he loves his country and he's in tourism. He wants to soak the tourist industry there. And finally, after revolutions and after war and terrorism and after so many disappointing turns of events that scared away all the tourists, things were calm, everything was in place and we filmed a wonderful one hour special on Egypt. Tarek is not normally a very relaxed guy, but I never saw him so relaxed as when he's hanging out at the shisha joint right here. We both kind of had settled in. We could have spent the rest of the evening here, but we had a lot to shoot. The beautiful scene, it's easy to relax here. So relaxing, comfortable, peace. A lot of people in the United States, they say this would be a, a, a hookah or a hubbly bubbly. What is this in Egypt? Shisha, it's called shisha. shisha. Yeah. Yeah, and few people now call it hookah, hubbly bubbly, argila. Is it some tobacco or what are we smoking? It's a tobacco flavored with different uh, tastes. It could be apple, strawberry, mint, too many. If I smoke and smoke and smoke, will I get dizzy? If you spend like two or three hours, you would get dizzy. Okay. This is one, finishing one of those is like finishing two packets of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but the people are doing it all the time. We do it casually. Let's just vent out, be casual, socializing, you know, talking with friends. We do, we do it with close friends. We vent out and talk yeah. uh, and have fun. Yeah. While clearly Tarek could spend the rest of the evening right here, we've got some exploring to do. A short walk is filled with cultural serendipity. And we'll start with dessert. 
It's hard to walk by this place without enjoying at least a taste. Absolutely, and delicious. That looks great. What are these? This is Sawaba Zainab, Zainab's fingers. Zainab's fingers? Mm. Shukran. Thank you, shukran. Mm. The key to this kind of sightseeing? Have a curious spirit, have fun, and explore. These guys are way too fast for me. The entire neighborhood is an endlessly fascinating market, and it's open late. There's fresh bread, very fresh poultry, olives straight from the desert, and something I noticed everywhere, friendly and inviting people. I know about six words of Arabic, but it didn't stop the smiles. You can get whatever you need around here, including a quick trim before dinner. Wow, so much joy, so much joy, so much love, so much happiness. When you look at the people, that's what makes a good trip. Think about people who have never traveled, how afraid they are of going to Egypt. I didn't handpick these people. That's just who filled the market, those delightful, delightful characters. And we can meet them all in our travels. Uh, good travel, again, it's connecting with people and uh, connecting with artisans. And the artisans you meet are so proud of what they produce. And we have a great opportunity in our travels to support those artisans. I hope you enjoyed our look at the artisans of Europe and the Mediterranean. Thanks so much. Hey, Gabe, I bet we have some questions. We do have a lot of excellent questions tonight, Rick. And before we get to them, I would love a word from our sponsor. Well, thank you, Gabe. And the big news in our company, as you know, uh, there's uh, we bought about 100 people, 97 people, plus you and Lisa and me. And we are just so excited that uh, looks like things are going to be opening up for European travel next year. We've been very conservative about our tour program. It's the major source of revenue for all of us. We've had a year and a half now with almost no revenue and 100 people on our payroll. And now we see a light at the end of the tunnel. And we've kept our team together the best we can. We have uh, been just keeping our contacts in Europe going. We've been taking good care of our, of our travelers. And now it looks like uh, things are going to be opening. Uh, people are going to be traveling more later in, in 2021. And we have opened up our tour sales for 2022. And for me, I'm just amazed at how much um, support we've had. We opened the floodgates and we've had 23,000 people sign up for our tours. Again, if you want to learn more about our tours, go to ricksteves.com, go to the tour section and see what's going on there. But um, everything you've seen on this artisan show, this is the kind of stuff we put together in our tours. I hope you can check that out and I hope you can enjoy it. And right now, Gabe, I'd love to answer some questions. All right, Rick. So our first question tonight comes from Trevor. Um, and Trevor is wondering, how do you differentiate between um, traditional, authentic artisan goods and things that maybe have been manufactured and are trying to be passed off as artisan goods? Yeah, well, there's a lot of naive tourists that are sold cheap glass in Venice from China. I mean, any glass maker or um, artisan in, in Venice, for example, is just disgusted at how many irreparable or ir what it, sho shops without a good reputation uh, are selling uh, Chinese imported glassware. I mean, fine, if you want Chinese glassware, it's, it's a quarter of the price, but don't go to Venice and pay too much to buy something you think is Venetian that's not Venetian. So you got to make a point to ask locally, how do you know that's a local piece of art. And um, it's a very important thing. It's the same with carpets in Turkey. Uh, um, you know, uh, um, all over Europe, you'll have uh, uh, artisans. But I think if you go to a, a shop that is a venerable, beloved local shop, it people are too proud to be selling knockoff stuff. If you buy it from somebody on the street, that's going to be a knockoff. I mean, people that sell things on the street in Europe are famous for selling things at a quarter of the price that are imported from far away. So just to be on the ball that way. Um, additionally, Rick, once you find a good product that you wanna buy, uh, Christine is wondering, are there any um, things that you need to take into account when you're thinking about how to get it home? 
especially well, if maybe it's a larger item or a fragile oh, item. Yeah. Christina, when you're traveling and you buy something that's um, more pricey or more fragile or bigger, uh, generally, if you buy it from a, a, an established shop, they are set up to ship it home and do all the book work for you, all the customs work, figure out how to get that um, um, duty-free uh, uh, discount or rebate, and they will take it off of your purchase price in a lot of cases. I'd rather pay the net price without the tax in there rather than pay full price and then have to process it myself and find out where to get my rebate at the airport. So whenever you buy something from an established shop that's an expensive item, ask them to mail it home for you. It's safer. You don't need to be burdened by it for the rest of your trip and they take care of the duty-free refund for you. That to me is critical. If you're buying a bunch of stuff from little shops that don't have the wherewithal to do that, whenever I get a, a small box, a shoe box almost worth of stuff, I don't want to carry it around. I'm really fanatic about that. I'll go to the post office and I will ship it home that way. It's pretty straightforward. It takes you a few minutes, but then you're unencumbered by that for the rest of your trip. Rick, our next question comes from Liz, who wants to know, um, have you ever had the opportunity to try out an artisanal craft or trade um, while traveling or been inspired to try one when you get home? Uh, you know, I made a fresco in Florence and it was one of the most beautiful experiences. And I worked in a workshop and we did all this, I think it's called the Sinope and the dots and the, and uh, it, with the wet plaster. And then they, they uh, you know, uh, fixed it and, and heated it up. We came by the next day and picked it up. And it was a treasure for me to be able to make it in a traditional way, in a traditional shop, pick it up and take it home. On our uh, Portugal tour, Portugal is really into uh, glazed um, tileware. And our whole group got to go to a tile um, artisan um, workshop and we learned how to paint our own tile. And then they baked it for us and we came and it was waiting for us at the hotel, as a matter of fact, the next morning. And that's one of the little experiences we include on our Portugal tour. But all over Europe, if you want to have those hands-on artisan experiences, you can. You have to organize them. Uh, tour companies like ours like to make those happen. But if you're on your own, you can make that happen just as much as you can make a cooking school in Paris happen, where you go shopping in the markets with, with a famous chef, and then you go back to his or her kitchen and you, you cook something and you eat it. That's all an experience. And Europe is really into experiences these days, and I'd highly recommend it. Um, Rick, uh, Susan really enjoyed the then and now portion that you showed. Um, and she was wondering, how has the things that you carry with you. We always see you with your little backpack. How have the things that you carried with you on your trips changed in the past 25 years? Boy, I think I've, I think I've got my, yeah, I've got my little day bag right here. And this, during COVID, this has been my, whenever I'm going somewhere, I just pack it up in this. But this is my little Chippy Today bag. You know it well, Gabe. And I, um, I've been- so. I've been using this same thing. Sorry, it's all discombobulated here, but I've been using this for probably 30 years. This is just an updated version of it. It's much better now than when we started, but I use exactly the same setup. I've got my nine by 22 by 14 inch soft-sided carry on the airplane size convertible suitcase rucksack. And that's what we sell for, I think $120. And then we've got this Chivy Today bag. So you got the big bag that you leave in the car, under the bus, on the ship, in the hotel, check it at the air, air, uh, train station, and then you're out and about with this little bag. That's, there's no question. I've been to Europe 100 days every year till COVID since I was a teenager, and I always carry two bags, one big one and one little one. The little one's my runabout bag, and the big one, obviously, is where you leave all your stuff in the hotel. So it hasn't changed at all, unless we've redesigned it a little bit, and that's evolved over the years. Are there any specific items that you carry with you that have changed though within the packs? You know, I'm not pack very... more technology now than you did 25 years ago. I'm not a technology fiend so much. I mean, I'm passionate about my laptop, which gets smaller and smaller and better and better and faster and faster. And my reliance on it becomes more and more. Um, our iPhone is a, our you know, smartphone is a huge tool for travel. And I remember the day, or the, the year, it was a decade ago or something, where we just said, an on-the-ball traveler has to have a phone. And we designed our books around, assuming somebody has a phone. My personal little guilty extra pleasure would be my noise reduction headphones. 
because I just love to snooze on the plane or on the on the train without any noise. And it also, if I'm wearing my noise reduction headphones, I don't get interrupted by people. And sometimes I like that when I'm having my private time on a flight. Um, but my bag is pretty simple. I've got a one hour lecture, by the way, as part of probably 30 hours of lectures that are available on our website at ricksteves.com. And if somebody wants to hear my one hour lecture on packing, I talk about all those things. And um, that's a pretty good rundown on what I travel with and why. So Rick, I think that we'd agree that no matter how good our smartphones get, they're still not a replacement for a good trusty guidebook. Um, and Deborah was wondering, um, how can she find the best guidebook information going into 2022? Um, what is the, oh, yeah, the COVID guidebook thing. world yeah. like right now? Well, we don't know. It's kind of like um, Y2K, if people remember that 22 years ago, 21 years ago, when we didn't know what it was going to be like after uh, the first day of the millennium because of all the Y2K concerns. Um, I think we don't know what it's going to be like when we go back to Europe as far as reliable information in a guidebook goes, because a lot of small businesses have not survived COVID. My hunch is that the, the vast majority of them will have survived, thanks to government uh, support and thanks to local patronage and thanks to trimming their sales and just hunkering down and making it through this very difficult, um, long, long time of uh, business, uh, uh, slow business. Uh, but uh, they've still got to get through one more winter of bad business. So there'll be a fair amount of places closed. I would say if you are relying on a guidebook, and I'm the kind of person that relies on a guidebook, um, I would say if you're traveling in this year or next year, you're going to have, you're not going to have post COVID information. That's the thing. Um, we're going to be updating our guidebooks, but not until COVID's over. If I sent everybody over there right now and we updated our guidebooks, that'd be worse than not updating them at all because we don't know what's going to happen because of COVID. So we can only update our 2019 guidebooks. Obviously, we couldn't do them in 2020 or 2021. In 2022, after things are back to pretty much normalcy, and then it's all hands on deck and we're going to rush it through the whole process. And we hope to have post COVID guidebooks in the bookstores by Christmas of 2022. You see, so in 2023, people will have honestly post COVID guidebooks, and that'll be great. But for travel this year and for travel next year, I would say it's okay. We're lucky to be traveling. We're lucky we're still alive. We're lucky come little businesses are still standing. Use a good guidebook that was up to date in 2019. Don't trust anybody that says they've got post COVID information because they don't. They can't start researching that until spring of 2022, and then it takes better part of a year to get it into the bookstores. And I wouldn't rely on, on the online information for that either. So use your pre-COVID information and just recognize that a lot of little businesses will have died or changed, and you just got to be flexible. All right, Rick, we have time for one last question. It comes from Eric, who is six years old. I'm hoping that he stayed up late enough um, to hear the answer to his question. Um, but you have mentioned in the past your, your dogs that kept you company um, during quarantine. And he was wondering where they go for Monday night travel, um, or if you could give some more information about them. <laughs> Well, the dogs are my girlfriend's dog and she's not here on Monday because I'm working all day. So they're at her place. And when they are here, when Shelly comes over, she's usually here with the dogs. I let her come in if she doesn't have dogs, but I, I'm, I gotta say, I am a little disappointed. I love those dogs so much. If the dogs are ever here on a Monday night by some change, by some chance, I'll be sure to show you, okay? Thank you, Eric. And I hope you are enjoying your dogs too. <laughs> hey, Gabe, thank you for those questions. Thanks to everybody. For your questions. I want to remind you next Monday night, we've got a special show. We're going to Basque country and we're joined by our favorite Basque guide, Francisco Glaria. He's from Pamplona. That's the running of the bulls town. And he's just a delight. He's going to get up at 3 30 in the morning to be with us for Monday night travel here in the United States. Cause he lives in Spain in Basque country. And that's going to be a great show. Uh, a week after that, we've got quirky museums. And a week after that, we've got Islamic side trips. So lots of great Monday night travels coming up. Tell your friends, we got plenty of, plenty of room and we'd love to have you here. So I just want to thank you again for joining us. And I'll remind you that we've got lots of great travels coming up. So happy travels. Mm -hmm.